Green! In the 21st century, it's more than just a color. It's the five-letter word we use to describe something as environmentally friendly. This colloquialism is very fitting, since all this green stuff that covers our planet plays such an essential role in keeping our biosphere alive and healthy. But what is a plant? According to my friend Merriam-Webster, a plant is a noun, and it's any of a kingdom of multicellular, eukaryotic, mostly photosynthetic organisms typically lacking locomotive movement or obvious nervous or sensory organs and possessing cellulose cell walls. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Kidding. I'm never done talking. It's easy to define what a plant is. The more interesting conversation is about what plants do. And I'll be honest with you, as a lifelong animal nerd, plants always kind of took a back seat in my mind, unless I needed one to decorate a windowsill or add some enrichment to a reptile enclosure. But let's face facts. Without plants, animal life, including human life, would cease to exist. Reason number one, breathing. We learned last week that between 50 and 80% of the oxygen in our atmosphere is produced by bacteria and algae. The other 20 to 50% is produced by plants. I'm breathing real good right now. But equally important to producing oxygen is reducing carbon dioxide. Luckily, all plants, especially trees, are very talented at absorbing and storing CO2 from the atmosphere. This isn't a selfless act on the plant's behalf, because CO2 is an essential ingredient in a plant's energy production, along with water and sunlight. Let me explain without having to break out the old chemistry textbook. I said not today, man, go home. Sorry, where was I? Simply put, plants generate energy for themselves in a process that we all know is photosynthesis. They harness energy from sunlight and then use that energy to convert water and CO2 into glucose and oxygen. The glucose acts as food for the plant, giving it the energy that it needs to grow and develop, while the oxygen is released back into the air as a waste product. That oxygen can then be used by animals, fungi, some protists, and some prokaryotes to produce energy for themselves. Beyond helping to provide an atmosphere to breathe in, plants also provide homes and habitats for countless of species worldwide. Most habitats on land are even classified by the types of plants that live there. In this way, Plants literally define the ecosystem that they reside in. For example, grasslands are dominated by grass and the hooved animals that graze on it. Woodlands are made up of trees that provide food and shelter for everything from mice to moose, and wetlands are made up of aquatic vegetation that creates a safe haven for flying insects to reproduce and provide food for insect-eating animals like frogs and fish. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but I can't overstate how deeply connected all of these life forms are to one another. If studying evolution has taught us anything, it's that cooperation and balance are more successful survival tools than domination and overconsumption. Charles Darwin was limited by the knowledge of his time when he coined the term survival of the fittest. Being the fittest is just a way to ensure the survival of the individual or the generation but it doesn't necessarily ensure the long-term success of a species. It's true that everything eats something else, but the reality is much more three-dimensional than that. This is why the term food chain is so misleading. If we really wanted to view the natural order of consumption as a top-down model, fungi would be at the top of the food chain. Because once an organism dies, fungi are the dominant consumers of the material left behind. But even this viewpoint is flawed because there are animals, protists, and some prokaryotes that consume fungi. So we don't really use the term food chain anymore in biology because it's just far too limiting. Instead, we use the term food web. I've talked a lot about how every living thing is connected at the genetic level but this isn't something that we need to go back in time to see clearly. Let's look at this guava tree, for example. Following the food chain model, we'd see that the guava tree eats via photosynthesis and is eaten by herbivores and insects. But let's step back and look at the full picture. The roots provide nutrients like carbon for microbes in the soil. And in return, those microbes fix and deliver nitrogen to the guava tree through those same roots. Above the ground, Guava trees produce stunning white flowers that attract pollinating insects like honeybees. The honeybee collects nectar from the flower to feed itself and its hive. And in the process, it also collects pollen on the outside of its body, which can then be transported by the honeybee to the next flower that it lands on, fertilizing that flower and sharing genetic information. In this example, the food web isn't just an exchange of nutrients, it's providing nutrients in exchange for assisted reproduction. The fertilized flower then creates fruit, which eventually ripens and falls to the forest floor, where it can be picked up by an animal and eaten. 
The animal will then carry the seeds off to a faraway location and pass them undigested in their waste, which not only creates a new generation of guava trees in a new area, it fertilizes the soil and provides nutrients to the seeds as well as any other plants or fungi in the area. Even when the guava tree dies and falls to the forest floor, bacteria, fungi, worms, and wood lice are then provided with a guaranteed habitat and source of food. And the animals that eat bacteria, worms, fungi, and wood lice benefit by finding a guaranteed source of prey. So just one guava tree provides the nutrients necessary to maintain the survival of herbivores, carnivores, frugivores, soil microbes, fungi, other plants, other members of its own species, and countless other species. That, my fellow homo sapiens, is the food web. Mwah. Next week, we're gonna take a look at the kingdom of Eukarya that best exemplifies the importance of community evolution, the kingdom most closely related to our own, the fungi. Until then, stay curious, stay connected, and never stop evolving.